I was in tropical waters off the coast of a small Latin American country, minding what I thought was my own business. This was purely a pleasure dive, and I was having fun poking through an interesting wreck. It was one that I hadn't seen before. Suddenly, it looked as though it might be the last wreck that I would ever see. I thought I had the situation under control, but when I got to the surface with my attacker, I found that my troubles were only beginning. Come aboard! Come on! hours later, I was in a cell in the capital city. All of my explanations, all my protests didn't do me a bit of good because a revolution had broken out and I was suspected of being in the service of the newly ousted dictator. Senor Nelson? Yeah? Permit me to introduce myself. I am Ramon Montoya, minister of the new government. My colleague here you have already met, Carlos Prado. Yeah, but... Senor, we have come here to apologize to you for the inconvenience you have suffered. Well, that's okay, if I can go now. You have been a victim of mistaken identity. I hope you will understand that when a dictator is overthrown, things are not very normal. I understand that. Uh, Senor, we would be most happy if you would wait for a few minutes. We would like to have a little talk with you. You mean you want to talk to me here? It is the quietest place in the city at the moment. Okay. What do we talk about? About you, Senor Nelson. And about liberty and freedom and democracy. Ideas that have been won most dearly here in the past few days. Now that we have verified your identity, we wish you to help us in our struggle. Oh, why me? Because of your reputation, both personally and professionally. Senor Nelson, we need your help in a project of great secrecy, but of vital importance to our success. 
such a big secret, I cannot even tell you now. Uh, if I don't know what it's all about, how can you expect an answer from me? I don't. Uh, not yet. I merely want to suggest that if you are sympathetic with our cause and are willing to listen to more, you permit us to make a show of force with you for the benefit of the enemy, to take him off the track. Like what? Like going through the motion of closing that door behind you again, of publicly uh, deporting you from our country as an enemy of our government to, say, a place like Nassau, where you will make a rendezvous with one of our agents and there await the development of our plan. Well, that sounds like real cloak and dagger stuff. Call it that if you wish, but uh, it will be explained to you at the right time. Then you can make your decision, yes or no. Mm. And uh, what if I say no now? What happens to me? The cell door is unlocked. You can walk directly out. Uh, you've aroused my curiosity. Lock the door again. Thank you, Senor Nelson. Thank you. We will justify your belief. Uh, I'm sure you will. Thank you, Senor. It was only a few days later, after being publicly deported, I sailed to Nassau. The next step in the weird plan was to check into the Nassau Beach Lodge. I was supposed to wait there until I got a message with the code word swordfish in it. Till that came, I was on my own. It started out as a pleasant interlude. I sunned myself and made friends with some of the other guests at the hotel. No one could have taken me for anything but a tourist. But after a few days, I found myself impatient. I hadn't had any word from my mysterious contact, let alone the one word that I was waiting for. Then I got a telephone call. Hello. Mr. Nelson? Yeah, this is Mike Nelson. I have the report for you on the fishing conditions. Go ahead. The swordfish are leaping in the harbor. Good. I headed for historic old Fort Montague, where I could get a good look at the harbor. One of the boats in the harbor was flying a pennant, and on the pennant was a swordfish. I realized who my contact was when I spotted a familiar face. It was Prado, who had arrested me the week before. But now he was out of uniform. I was more intrigued than ever. I knew that I was wanted aboard. I approached the boat from underwater. It reduced to a minimum the chances of being observed. In the boat's cabin, I learned what it was all about. All this secrecy may seem foolish to you, but now I can explain and you can judge. I'm listening. As you must know, the dictator fled when we moved in on the city. But he took the precaution two days before to load most of the money in the national treasury on a vessel which sailed for Florida. Smart guy. He was no fool. But you have not heard it all. Knowing that under international law, the United States government would impound the vessel and return the money to the legal government of our country, he scuttled the vessel not far off our coast. Money and all. Well, what good would the money do him on the bottom of the ocean? For the moment, none. But once it becomes known to the world that our treasury is bankrupt, then our stability is threatened and the road is wide open for the tyrant to march back into power. Uh, then he salvages the money and the uh, show starts all over again, huh? Correct. Well, why don't you salvage the money? Well, that is... Ah, uh, yeah, I see. That's where I come in, huh? That is where you come in. Well, you got your own divers. I met one of them. We have divers. Good ones. 
But we also, I regret to say, have spies, traitors, and subversives in our ranks. Men who, for personal gain, would welcome back a dictator. That is why we come to you. I see. You will do it, Senor Nelson? The pay will be good. But the cause will be better. Senor Prado, you got yourself another diver. Thank you, senor. Prado and I left the Bahamas far behind and moved toward our objective by a very casual, indirect route. And then we wandered into Rafael Bay, where the ship had been scuttled. The bay and the shoreline appeared to be completely deserted. Carlos, let me see that chart. I worked over charts of the bay, concentrating mainly on the depth levels. In that way, I estimated the logical place at which a ship would be scuttled without being too deep to be easily reached. On my first dive, I hit it practically on the nose. There was a ship down there, all right. I went in to investigate. I knew that I'd have to proceed with my guard up every second. There was no way of telling what might be waiting inside. There it was, what looked like the missing gold reserves, the lifeblood of the country's economy. ever so quietly to bring up the money. Not such a quiet job after all. No. You stay here. I'll take a look. Get out of here. And give up the salvage? You wouldn't like that, huh? No. Well, we're a pair of sitting ducks right now. We gotta move out of this spot. And not come back? 
I'll come back. But under what? At the end of about two hours, we decided that it was safe to get back aboard our boat. And we were right. The riflemen on the shore had given up, convinced that they had either killed us or scared us off. Not to disillusion them on the latter point, we wasted no time getting out of there. We anchored some distance away out of range of fire from the shore, and I prepared to swim back to the scuttle ship. Are you crews slowly by in about 45 minutes, huh? Looks like they're gonna shoot at you. Keep moving. It didn't take me long to reach the ship again. I headed straight for the treasure cabin. But something struck me as peculiar. It seemed to me that I had left the cabin door open. Now it was closed. I looked it over carefully. There was a wire, barely visible. And just below it, a booby-trapped grenade. A bomb that could have destroyed me in another moment. Now I realize the shooting up above was not an isolated incident. Someone was playing for keeps. Thanks to my Navy frogman experience, booby traps were no puzzle to me. I found a splinter of steel and deactivated the grenade with it. I looked inside, but nothing had been touched in the cabin. I rigged the tripwire so that no one else would know the bomb was disarmed. Then I got out of there, fast. Whoever said that booby trap couldn't be very far away. I decided to wait for him. I found what seemed like a very good vantage point, well hidden in rocks and giving me an excellent view of anyone who might approach the ship from any direction. Unfortunately, the men for whom I was watching had seen me first. While I was keeping my eyes on the ship, they were already closing in on me from an angle that would completely cut me off from my own boat. One of them got around front to distract me. The other hit from behind. I broke away and raced for the treasure ship. There was a chance for me there, if I could get far enough in front. I sprinted for the booby trap doorway. Not knowing that I had disarmed the booby trap, they could only assume that I would blow us all to kingdom come. They preferred discretion to valor. No, 
Now they knew that I knew about their booby trap. What they expected next, I didn't know. But I was sure that after a certain amount of time, they'd come back to look for me if they didn't see me leave the ship. I had a plan. Two men conferred at a safe distance from the ship. Then the leader sent his buddy back. I heard him coming. I got set for him. pinched off his air. To breathe it all, he had to give up. The knife against his ribs gave me full command. With the first man as a shield, I moved back out toward the deck. I knew the second man would be out there waiting, and I knew what to do. I disabled the first man's air supply. Then the second man was on top of me. He was a dangerous antagonist, skilled with a knife. point was against his stomach. It was over. traidor, sin vergüenza. ¿Qué quieres? ¿Que te pida perdón? No, no me necesitas de pedir perdón. Mi gente te va a perdonar. Ahora verás, sin vergüenza. Tú vas a pagar con tu vida. Ya no, mamá. Both of them. Señor Nelson, let me introduce to you Colonel Emilio Merida, former head of counterintelligence for the dictator. And for us, a real price. But this, this one, one we trusted, a man we never suspected, but who can now explain this entire plan to us. That's great. With this information, I'm sure we can continue the salvage on a full scale, out in the open. Uh, looks like I worked myself out of a job. Out of a job, senor, but into the hearts of my countrymen. All right, you'll be taking stuff off you. You still want to fight, huh? But you had enough down there. Hi, I'm Lloyd Bridges, inviting you to join us for another action-packed story of underwater adventure one week from today.
I was in a diving expedition in the Indian Ocean off the Madagascar coast. I'm Mike Nelson. With me was Joe Ainsley, the organizer of the expedition. We were descending slowly, giving our bodies every chance to adjust to the increasing pressure, because we were going deep. Joe was carrying a still camera and I had a strong net. I also carried a new electronic fish finder, a device which could help to spot fish underwater. All this was part of a dress rehearsal for the strangest hunt ever. We were going after a creature once thought dead for 60 million years. The fish called coelacanth. Somehow the coelacanth had survived to the present day. One had been captured in 1938. Another in 1952, in these same waters. Both specimens had been caught in a fisherman's trawl. Neither had survived. Our plan was to net this living fossil by hand and bring it up as slowly as our own safety required. First, of course, we had to find one. Joe wasn't used to these depths. I signaled to him to hold it and started down myself. If I found anything, I would try to do the netting and Joe would take photographs. The fish finder began to register a steady movement about 20 feet below. I thought I'd left Joe where he'd be out of danger. But only a few instants later, a cold downdraft pulled Joe head over heels right toward me. Then it hit me, too. It took us down, deep. I finally managed to grab Joe. got us both out. Joe was panicking. All I could think of now was the security of the surface. Before I could stop him, he had shoved me aside and was on his way up. In his panic, he was forgetting to breathe out. That meant that as he ascended and the pressure on his body lessened, the captive air in his lungs was expanding. I had to reach him before they burst. I punched him in the stomach to make him start breathing out and in again. His fast ascent had been short, but enough to give him an embolism. Unless we got him into the recompression chamber fast, he wouldn't live to catch a coelacanth or anything else. Luckily, the chamber was waiting for us in my boat, along with an ex-Navy doctor, Stan Morton, and Joe's fiance, Rita Julian.
this. That's all right, roll. Look out. I can hold his feet, huh? That way? Yeah. I got him around. All right. Two hours later, Joe was still in the chamber. Alice Julian, Rita's mother and the widow of a famous marine biologist, was content just to know that Joe was safe. Rita wanted to know a lot more. You still haven't told us, Mike. What happened? What went wrong? What did he do down there? What difference does it make now? Well, it makes a great deal of difference to me. Joe's a businessman. Yes, he is, my dear, and a brilliant one. He organized this expedition most efficiently. And let's face it, at tremendous cost. Why? To do what he can to carry on with your father's work. Rita Joe would do anything to please you. Well, he won't do it this way. Listen, I'll tell you what happened down there. We got caught in a freak current, and it swept us down below 250 feet and nothing flat. When we got clear, uh, Joe headed up a little too fast, that's all. Did he lose his head? Well, he'd never been in a spot like that before. Then he did lose his head. It could happen to anybody. It didn't happen to you. And it wouldn't have happened to my father. Rita, father was a wonderful man. But even he could make mistakes. He wouldn't have made this kind of a mistake. Well, perhaps not. But does that make Joe any less desirable as a human being? No. But it might as a husband. Well, that all depends, my dear, on how much of your married life you spend together underwater. Oh, oh Doc. How is he? Well, it's a little soon to say for certain, but you'll be all right, though, huh? Yeah, completely, I think. Thank heaven for that. May I go to him? I wish you would go to him. Perhaps you can talk some sense into him. Apparently, I can't. Sense about what? Well, he's bound to determined to go down again with Mike tomorrow. Why, did he say? And Joe Ainsley sets his mind on something, he keeps after it until he gets it. He's quite a man. I think so. The next day, we were preparing for another dive. I must admit, I was on Joe Ainsley's side. I felt his sweetheart was a bit mixed up. But I still needed to be sure that he was ready before I took him hunting with me again. I checked and double-checked all of our equipment. I discussed our times and depths with Doc Morton. In fact, I discussed our whole diving plan step by step, making it as conservative as possible, stressing safety rather than a long, deep dive. You all set to go, Joe? Be ready in a minute. This is something you really want to do, Joe, isn't it? <laughs> it was when we started the expedition. It still is. We're going to get us a coelacanth if we're lucky. Well, this is the area where the coelacanthidae logically should be found, so you may. Good luck to you. Thanks. And um, if you do sight one, darling, keep your head, please. Yeah, I'll try. Let's go. You check your air. Joe Ainsley was fighting mad. So mad that he could forget to turn on his air. And that scared me, for both of us. Where we were heading, an angry decision could be the last one that a man ever made. Throw me the net. Ainsley and I worked our way slowly downward, checking our descent frequently. We planned to use the same procedure as before. Joe seemed in fine shape, no dizziness or distress. I felt fine too.
So there was no reason to start seeing things. But I did. I saw it in the finder. And then with my eyes. Something that no man had ever seen. A coelacanth. Swimming freely in its native element. The living, breathing replica of its fossil ancestors. Supposedly dead for millions of years. Joe again waited to take what could be some very important photographs for marine biologists. The coelacanth seemed almost to be waiting for me. Actually, it was studying me and waiting for me to make a move. When I moved, it moved. Returned to Joe's station by the safety line. I had come so close that I felt I had to make another try. Nothing had ever seemed so important, nothing in all my life. Joe insisted on coming along, and I let him. I had to capture that beautiful, beautiful, bright blue fish. I didn't realize the depth was affecting both of us in body and mind. My judgment was becoming clouded. We were both away from the safety line and didn't see the slate when it came down. When I looked at my watch, I realized that I should have checked the time long before. We had stayed down twice as long as our diving plan had called for. When we reached the guideline, I read the message on the slate. Must come up now. I certainly agreed. But Joe was already in pain. The pressure and the spell of the chase had dulled our judgment. That one little mistake could be big enough to kill or cripple us both. Chasing a rare fish, the coelacanth, we had stayed down too long and too deep. I had my hands full getting Joe to the surface and keeping him from drowning on the way. Doc Morton knew it. We'd have to go right into the chamber. procedure was simple. It just took time. First, the air pressure within the chamber was raised according to treatment tables. This affected the harmful gases which had filtered into the systems and held them in check. It kept us from developing the terrible pains of the bends. 
then, over a period of hours, the pressure was lowered, and the harmful gases began coming out slowly and safely. All the time, though, Ainsley held on to one idea. Joe's idea was to go after that coelacanth again, as soon as we could. Those were my sentiments, too. But Dr. Morton turned thumbs down on the idea. Now, look, you've had two very rough experiences within a fairly short time. You're not an Iron Man, you know. One more accident down Why there. Why put it on that basis? We may not run into any trouble at all. Mike, you'll be working at or below 200 feet again, won't you? That's right. Then it's just too risky, Joe. I want you to call it quits. I'm sorry, Doc. I'm going to get me a coelacanth. They promised Rita. The doctor says you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. He didn't say that. There's nothing wrong with you, granted, but there's a potential danger There's that... a danger in anything. Sorry, gents. You're going to have to do better than that. It's up to you to talk him out of it. Up to me. After you gave him a clean bill of health? It means too much to him. But he's not that much of a scientist, is he? No, he's not. But he's not gonna quit until he gets what he's after. And I'm not so sure it's just a coelacanth. There's a coelacanth down there, at least one. We've gotta find him. Let Mike do it, he's the expert. Alone? Not a chance, I wouldn't let him. Joe, I don't want anything to happen to you. It would kill Rita, really it would. No, nothing's gonna happen to him. Well, you can't be sure. Mrs. Julian, this is something I must do. Why? To prove yourself to Rita? I've got news for you. Capturing a seal coelacanth would make me feel pretty good, too. Yes, but killing yourself to do it won't accomplish a thing. She can't marry a ghost. Oh, now, Joe, I'll talk to her. She's silly and childish, even if she is my own daughter. But she does love you. I hope you're right. Right about what? Oh, hi. About coming on this expedition, even if we don't catch a coelacanth. Is Mike going down again? Yeah, I'm going down with him. I don't think you should, Joe. <laughs> Why not? Because I don't think you have the temperament for this kind of work. Well, look at what happened to the pictures. <laughs> so maybe they're not the greatest underwater shots in the world. Joe, they didn't come out at all. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. You apparently got so excited, you forgot to turn the film. Double exposure? Optical. Eight exposures on the same negative. Face it, darling, this just isn't your dish of tea. Excuse me, I think I'll tell Mike to get ready. Joe, please don't. Rita's worries only made Joe all the more anxious to get a coelacanth. I felt that we had to keep trying, too. And if catching it also won Joe Ainsley a bride, so much the better. Maybe. My indicator said there was some kind of big fish swimming slowly by, about 30 feet off. Still, when I saw the coelacanth, for a moment at least, I couldn't be sure that it wasn't an hallucination. But it was the coelacanth. When it turned and started off, I knew for sure. We had been right in thinking that this one was making a permanent home in this particular spot. Joe wasn't taking pictures. I didn't find out why till later. He was beginning to black out.
This coelacanth must have been a she, because just when I decided that it was hopeless and I couldn't possibly catch her, then she swam right down to the bottom and I scooped her up in the net. I saw why Ainsley had skipped the picture taking. Joe was showing very clear signs of anoxia. The deeper you go and the longer you stay there, the more you risk robbing your brain of the oxygen that it needs, especially with exertion. That's what was happening to Joe Ainsley now. The next step I knew would be unconsciousness, unless we started up immediately. He couldn't even keep his air hose in his mouth. So now I really had my hands full, supporting Joe and trying to hold on to the coelacanth. To make things worse, Joe kept indicating that I should save the fish instead of him, and he was insisting. Ainsley was in worse shape than I had realized. He was passing out. I'd have to give him my full attention. Only I couldn't. The coelacanth would slip out. Something had to give. Obviously, we had to lose the coelacanth. But it wasn't obvious to Joe Ainsley. He still wanted to bring that fish to the surface regardless of what happened to him. I let the fish go. Despite Joe's objections, the coelacanth had to go back down to freedom so that I could get him back up to life on the surface. Dr. Morton took over when I got Ainsley aboard. And once again, I had to explain to Alice and Rita what had happened. Uh. How is Joe? He's going to be all right. I'd never forgive myself if that Neither boy... Neither would I. Letting him dive to that depth again, just knowing he didn't have proper judgment. Will you stop that, Rita? No, she's right. He does have terrible judgment. Really, Mike? Yeah. Once he knew that there was a choice of getting himself to the service of the coelacanth, he insisted on me saving the fish. That's kind of stupid to me. Don't you think? Out of the chamber and come along fine. Good. I think it would be better if you didn't, Rita. I'm afraid she's right, Rita. Really. Mike, is what you said true? About saving the coelacanth? Yes. Yeah, it's true. Well, I'm sure glad you weren't that dumb. You think I'm dumb? No. I think you're wonderful. Bridges. Skin diving is certainly a lot of fun, and it's full of adventure. See some more of it again next week, huh? When there'll be another excursion into that fabulous underwater world of Sea Hunt. <laughs>